Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. Today is Thursday, August 18th, 2016. And here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight, report the U.S. is moving nukes closer to Ukraine. Then, how Saudi Arabia has been funding the Clinton campaign. And on the hills of some suggesting that Trump should be given fake intelligence, the Republican nominee has stated that he does not trust intelligence agencies. It's obvious he can't control his mind or his tongue. And what I've suggested, if now because he's the nominee for the party uh, and he gets, he's entitled to briefings from the CIA, for example, I told, I said publicly, give him fake briefings. Pretend you're briefing. Don't tell him anything that you don't want to get out. Uh, and that's how I feel about it. I think that the man is a loose cannon. I think he's done so much to hurt our country. That's next. Donald Trump says he doesn't trust the American intelligence agencies. Just hours before Trump was due to receive a classified briefing from members of U.S. intelligence. He said he will not employ the standard intelligence community figureheads because he doesn't trust them. When asked by Fox News if he trusts intelligence, he said, not so much. Do you trust intelligence? Uh, not so much from the people that have been doing it for our country. I mean, look what's happened over the last 10 years. Look what's happened over the years. I mean, it's been catastrophic. And in fact, I won't use some of the people that are sort of your standards, you know, just use them, use them, use them. Very easy to use them. But I won't use them because they've made such bad decisions. You see there, Trump's not stupid. He knows and we all know about the fake intelligence reports leading up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And we also know about the recent declassified, yet still heavily redacted, 28 pages that says the government of Saudi Arabia and members of the Saudi royal family helped finance and train the 9-11 hijackers. And that, my friends, is an act of war. Yet we went to war with Iraq and Afghanistan, but not Saudi Arabia. Yeah, explain that one to me. I mean, just think about that for a minute. The government of Saudi Arabia helped carry out 9-11. They funded the hijackers, and now they are funding Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. So you can't really blame Donald Trump for not trusting U.S. intelligence reports, especially after Harry Reid, the Democratic Senate minority leader, said the CIA and other intelligence communities should give Donald Trump fake intelligence. What I've suggested... If now, because he's the nominee for the party uh, and he gets, he's entitled to briefings from the CIA, for example, I told, I said publicly, give him fake briefings. Pretend you're briefing him. Don't tell him anything that you don't want to get out. But as a Republican nominee, isn't he entitled to get those briefings? Give him fake briefings. What does that even mean? It means they'll tell him stuff. He won't know the difference. You're basically telling the intelligence community to lie to him. No, no, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to lie to you, but I still have to tell you everything. All right, so there you go. You heard Harry Reid. He actually said that publicly and on live national television. So there's no doubt that Trump has very good reason to question pretty much anything and everything that he gets from these intelligence briefings. And by the way, he's, he's already got his own intelligence network put together from people that he can trust. And these are good people on the inside. Plus, he's got military officials, you know, guys like General Michael Flynn. And these are people that are not only standing up for Trump, but they are standing up for America. And they are fully aware of the catastrophic situation in the White House right now and the attempted globalist takeover of our country. And that's why the latest battle cry from the Trump campaign is Americanism, not globalism. Americanism, not globalism will be our credo. Americanism, not globalism. Americanism, not globalism. The era of economic surrender will finally be over. We will no longer surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. They have gotten the political establishment and the media establishment to become pure 
wanton henchmen of totalitarianism. If you were a foreign power looking to weaken America, you couldn't do better than Hillary Clinton's economic agenda. I think what the Chinese have done is really smart. The skyscrapers went up in Beijing and many other cities around the world, while the factories and neighborhoods crumbled right here in Detroit. It's all training us to accept less, lowering expectations, a post-industrial world, a new dark age. That's what the UN Biological Diversity Assessment 1996 calls for. When we abandoned the policy of America first, we started rebuilding other countries instead of our own. Not a world, Winston, that gets more beautiful and more technological and stronger. A world that gets uglier and stupider and more stunted. That they, the, the, the uh, government should allow Hillary Clinton to become president of the United States. I voted for uh, Hillary Clinton. Well, I voted for Hillary. I guess I have to since I'm working for her as well. You want an image of the future, Winston? It's a boot stomping on a human face forever. Muslims are peaceful and tolerant people and have nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism. Women are treated, discriminated against in all of these countries she took money against. Gays and lesbians are either executed or punished severely. They're mistreated. Uh, she claims to be their champion. Don't look at me, Winston, and see the black circles around my eyes and see how ugly and weak I am expressing myself and dying that I torture people 18 hours a day and I have a horrible life. That's the beauty of the satanic evil of the priest of power ripping apart humanity. We're here to hurt humans. We're here to suck your guts out. All right, we've got breaking news right now that the U.S. is moving nukes closer to the Ukraine. Now, these reports are being denied by the Pentagon. However, sources tell us that there are nuclear missiles in Turkey and now Romania. This is a very, very dangerous situation. We're talking about at least 50 tactical nukes that are stored only 70 miles from the Syrian border. And according to your active, 20 more tactical nukes on the way to Romania, which just happens to share the border with the Ukraine. Now, we've told you before how the U.S. claims that they are installing anti-ballistic missile systems there in, at those locations in case there is an attack by Iran. But Russia's not falling for it because they know full well that these anti-missile systems can be converted or repurposed overnight into short-range and mid-range missiles. This means they could strike Russia within five minutes, basically leaving Russia completely defenseless and totally surrounded. Not to mention that this is a direct violation of the American-Russian nuclear arms treaty that was signed by both countries during the Cold War back in the 1980s during the Ronald Reagan era. And Vladimir Putin, he's made it perfectly clear that he believes that the United States and Russia are on a collision course towards nuclear war. We know year by year what's going to happen, and they know we know. It's only you that they tell these fables and you buy it and spread it to the citizens of your countries. Your people do not feel a sense of the impending danger. This is what worries me. How do you not understand that the world is being pulled in an irreversible direction? That is the problem. But they pretend like nothing's going on. Uh, I don't even know how to get through to you people anymore. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked with Paul Craig Roberts, the father of Reaganomics, and we both agree that there's no way that Vladimir Putin is going to allow nuclear missiles to surround Russia. What um, Putin was, uh, he was speaking to uh, journalists, I think not just Americans, but uh, all of Europe. Yep. And what he was telling them was that uh, they, uh, by repeating uh, propaganda about Russia and accusations uh, against Russia, they were enabling uh, the United States and NATO to uh, keep putting uh, military type pressures on Russia and that at some point these pressures uh, would no longer be
tolerable by Russia. They simply won't accept them. I think particularly he means the missiles in Poland and uh, Romania, mm -hmm. uh, because these missiles can be put there uh, as uh, ABMs, anti-ballistic missiles, but they can be very easily changed into uh, strategic nuclear attack missiles. So you think this is a violation of, of nuclear arms treaty back to your day when you know Ronald Reagan signed the nuclear arms treaty, it was the IMF treaty, and because these aren't just nuclear, anti-nuclear missile systems, like you said, they could be converted almost overnight into ballistic mi uh, missiles. We're talking short range and medium range missiles. Am I right? That's right. It, well, if you convert them into uh, nuclear attack missiles, then Russia's deterrent is, it does, is no good because uh, within five minutes, they would have hit all the targets in Russia. Mm -hmm. So he, he's made it kind of clear that uh, he's not going to accept that. And he has said over and over, I keep telling the Americans and the Europeans, and they don't hear. They don't hear. And he was pointing out to the journalists that because they uh, just repeat propaganda and never tell the truth about anything, that this is why the people in Washington can be so reckless and take so many reckless steps that are, are um, serious uh, uh, strategic threats to Russia. And if there was a news media reporting facts rather than propaganda, uh, then the United States would not be able to behave in such an aggressive and reckless way and therefore, the prospect of, uh, of a war would be much smaller. Uh, he says repeatedly that Russia doesn't want war. He doesn't in intend war. But that the uh, uh, Washington and NATO are behaving in such a reckless, aggressive uh, fashion that he has to expect that they intend war. Because when, when all you hear all day long is lies about yourself, in your country, yeah, uh, you assume you're being set up. You know, they've got most of the American population believing that uh, uh, Russia was, is going to invade Poland any minute. Yeah. The Baltics any minute. And they also I'm got everybody just, believing that Iran is, is going to attack us with nuclear missiles any minute. Thus, the reason for the anti-missile systems surrounding Russia, you know, and they're saying, oh, it's because of Iran. It's not because of Russia. It's because of Iran. And uh, Putin's not buying it. Well, he's already made the point over and over that uh, Iran uh, never had any nuclear missiles, and that now they especially don't because the Russians have taken charge of their uh, uranium enrichment, and they're not uh, uh, able to enrich anything beyond 5%. Mm -hmm. So there's no possibility of them making a nuclear weapon. So, yeah. Um, Putin knows that we're lying, and this is uh, the danger in it all, because when you publicly tell so many lies and you know that the person you're talking about knows you're lying, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, put them on, you, you put them on guard. So, um, you know, out of this can come uh, miscalculation particularly on the part of the United States, because uh, Russia continues to try to rely on diplomacy. But diplomacy is powerless if people don't care about the truth. And that's the case in Washington and, and with the NATO officials. And if the journalists can't challenge Washington and NATO, because they don't have the independence to do that, then diplomacy is at a dead end. And so it, the minute that Putin and Lavrov finally give up on diplomacy and realize that it's a dead end and nothing can come of it, then there, there's nothing left but force confronting force. Well, and that's basically what he's saying. He's, he's saying that Russia does not want a war but they are ready for war, and and they're not afraid to fight it. And I know that that last anti-missile system is set to be in place uh, in Poland in 2018, 
I just don't think that, you know, I think that might be pushing them too far. So I don't think they'll stand for it. Yeah, I don't think they're going to stand for it. And who could blame them? You know, they're completely surrounded. Again, that was a clip from a interview I had just a few weeks ago with Paul Craig Roberts, who says there's no way that Putin is going to settle for U.S. nukes surrounding Russia. We're now joined by InfoWars reporter Kit Daniels. And I, I just want to ask you, how dangerous is this? Because we're talking about a stockpile of nuclear weapons in Turkey that could fall in the hands of ISIS. Well, it's so dangerous uh, that I thought it was unbelievable at first because I almost didn't even run with the story. I thought it was a fake story. Mm -hmm. But then I remembered that a couple of days ago, there's this think tank, a uh, Western think tank that said that the 50 nukes that are in Turkey right now are in danger of being hijacked by ISIS. Because and all, Turkey and the United States relations aren't the best. Yeah, right not now. right now. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there's not only are these nukes stored in Turkey, but they're only about 70, 70 miles away from Syria. Yes. And you know how ISIS militants go in and out of Turkey and Syria border. We've covered and that you, for We know years. how we, uh, you know, we have these mysterious weapon caches that end up, ends up in the hands of ISIS. Mm -hmm. Toyota pickup trucks, surface-to-air yeah. missiles, tanks, you name it. So why not nukes? Yeah. Now there's this article in RT today about how Turkey is talking to Russia about working closer together with military aid and intelligence and mm -hmm. all that because Turkey feels... Frosted out by NATO, because like you said, their relationship with NATO right now is deteriorating yeah, fast. Yeah, deteriorating fast. And also, I'm speculating a little bit, but I also think that Turkey is losing control of ISIS. You know that we they've supported ISIS and trained and whatnot. Yep. But now just like see, they, yeah. they're, they're just as responsible with creating ISIS as the United States yeah. and NATO. But now they can't even control ISIS because ISIS is striking inside Turkey. Oh, what do you know? ISIS is out of control. Yeah. Can you believe it? Well, look, we knew this was going to happen. This could very well be the scapegoat. This is how the nuclear exchange could start. They could very well blame ISIS. Go to Infowars.com for more reports. We will be right back right after this. What has President Obama done with two terms as our commander-in-chief? Fix the economy? Nope. The national debt went from $10.6 to $19.5 trillion under his watch. And Obama is the only president in history to not see a 3% increase in the GDP. Healed division as the first black president? Nope. America is sitting on a powder keg of anarchy as a result of the Alinskyite methods unleashed by the White House and its lapdog media and the hordes of communists and faux civil rights movements under the umbrella of Black Lives Matter attacking their own communities. Kept America safe? Oh no. The United States just surpassed Europe in the admittance of Muslim refugees, 21% of which that will stop at nothing to foment jihad in our communities. As Orlando, San Bernardino, and 9-11 cast a dark shadow over national security, and Europe's example serves as a harsh warning for the very near future. Is it getting clearer? President Obama's achievements don't involve you the average U.S. citizen, be you on the left or the right or in the middle. His achievements are applauded by foreign bankers and oligarchs whose agenda reads like an instruction manual of the legacy of our 44th president of the United States. Obama came up big on one of his promises. He managed to bankrupt the coal industry, a huge boon to the natural gas industry, fracking its way across America. As oil and gas production has doubled over the past five years, the number of earthquakes rattling Oklahoma has surged. Until 2008, the state averaged one to two quakes, magnitude three or greater, per year. In 2015, it's averaged two per day. The coal industry has been devastated by nearly 30% since Obama took office. The Daily Caller reports, coal use fell in every state but Nebraska and Alaska, devastating both the coal power and the coal mining industries, and even forcing Peabody Energy, the world's largest coal company, to declare bankruptcy. Jobs hemorrhaged under the hugely unpopular corporatic Congress Obama presided over. China has been devastating our manufacturing base since 2001. Fifteen years later, nothing has been done to counter it. In fact, everything has been done to open the gaping wound. John Rappaport of No More Fake News writes, Obama is the Rockefeller globalist man in the White House. He's tasked with pushing through congressional ratification of the TPP come hell or high water. First, know that the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is a huge globalist trade deal among 12 nations that would phase out thousands of tariffs and set up corporate tribunals to punish nations that refuse to import goods, e.g. toxic pesticides, toxic medical drugs, GMOs, etc. In short, it's a nightmare. 
Wiping out tariffs is the cornerstone of the globalist agenda. It allows companies in industrial countries to move their factories to third world hellholes, pay slave wages, ignore environmental conditions, and then export their products back to the countries they abandoned with no tariffs, no taxes, no penalties. Meanwhile, White House mouthpiece Politico nonchalantly reports, President Barack Obama is taking the fight for the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal to America's streets. The White House is making an all-out push to win passage of the deal in the lame duck session of Congress, organizing 30 events over the congressional recess to gin up support for the agreement. If that isn't brainwashing, I don't know what is. Simultaneously, Obama's Department of Commerce is handing over the reins of the internet in October to a multinational authority that includes China, Russia, and Iran as an olive branch of Obama's failed foreign policy after the NSA had been discovered spying on world leaders, which more than likely was the ploy all along. Globalism is here, ladies and gentlemen. Your very existence and that of your descendants is at stake, as Obama sets up to throw a Hail Mary of treason in the final minutes of his New World Order presidency. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. A troubling report has come out in the Free Beacon, and usually I cite the Free Beacon because they're pretty reliable regarding information. But this one specifically is about Russia and Russia using military forces staging near Ukraine. And this came out today at 5 a.m. They assert that the Pentagon has identified eight staging areas in Russia where large numbers of military forces appear to be preparing uh, to enter the Ukraine. Uh, this is according to one unnamed U.S. defense official. Now, they're saying as many as 40,000 troops, including tanks, armored vehicles, Air Force units, they're now arrayed along Ukrainians' eastern border with Russia. And this is a very troubling report to me for a number of reasons. It's in English, and it reads like a propaganda piece. Now, the military exercises they're saying are ominous at this point. I'm directly quoting. Uh, but a similar large-scale Russian exercise was conducted, according to the Free Beacon, near Ukraine a month before Moscow carried out a, quote, covert military operation to take over this uh, strategic Black Sea Peninsula area. So I lived in Russia in March of, uh, you know, when, the, when Crimea fell during that time in 2014. And we've discussed here in Infowars time and again uh, the position that Russia has within our own foreign policy spectrum, specifically Putin's warning that happened that went largely unnoticed by Western media a couple of months ago, uh, declaring that we were on the offensive, that we were possibly uh, violating the terms of the Star Treaty that we have with Russia regarding using missiles, when to test them, when not to test them in Romania. And uh, specifically, he was saying that we're crossing red lines that cannot be undone. Now, Regarding this piece in the Free Beacon, there was also one that was put in the sun. Uh, it reads like a propaganda piece to me. And what, what's coming out of Russia, specifically Russian sources in English, is that Russia has no intention of arming and entering the Ukraine at this time or, or any other time. That while they did see the U.S. involvement in the Ukraine and its fall in 2014, they saw it as a provocation against Russia, that they don't have any intention at this time of doing a defensive measure or an offensive de measure, depending on what your foreign policy aspect is. So this article to me, I'm not calling bull entirely on it. I'd like to know the source, this U.S. defense official source at the time. We don't know it. They're not named. But what we do know is the counter narrative that's coming out of Russia in English is that they have no intention of entering the Ukraine at this time, despite two Russian military officials, soldiers, dying at the hands of uh, what they're calling Ukrainian terrorists. Now, a lot of misinformation, and I'm beginning to question, I would love to know why this is happening in English. And we're at a critical period, a critical juncture in uh, our own U.S. election cycle. And in some cases, if you can't steal or rig an election, the only thing to keep it off center and to possibly keep that from even happening would in fact be a war. And I really question at this time this propaganda piece coming out, I'd like to see more, more validity to it, more sources, more Russian sources that we could even translate here and, and put them into English and dissect them. But as of right now, being able to authenticate this article that's coming out, I just can't do it. Well, the evolution is continuing to unfold in the situation regarding the Ukrainian theater. More information is needed at this time. We'll keep you updated as it unfolds. Well, ISIS has a new warning. They're coming after Christians. Meanwhile, our politicians are telling us, hey, 
This isn't a religious war. A new video released from Daesh through their media propaganda arm Al Hayat Media shows the jihadis escorting 21 captured Egyptian Christians on a beach, presumably in Libya, and they presume to murder them. They murder these 21, beheading them. You see their blood flowing into the beach. Now, they say inside of this video in English that they plan on killing as many citizens of the cross as they possibly can. Here on Infowars.com, we've covered how ISIS has planned to target Christians and bombing churches wherever they can find them, including the U.S., and that one, in, in fact, one entire church here in the U.S. has been on a hit list from ISIS. They're doing this in English, and we take you through how exactly they're doing it in one particular article uh, written by Michael Snyder, uh, The End of the American Dream. It was posted yesterday on our website. I encourage you to take a look at it at its entirety. It lays out specific plans that ISIS has for Christians living here in the U.S. Now, meanwhile, our politicians with our open board policy a free-for-all. We're, we're a borderless society, especially if Hillary Clinton gets in office. We understand that 400,000 Syrians will be coming to the U.S. Most of those are unvetted. And we've seen from one British study that up to a third of their migrant crisis, up to a third of the migrants that are applying for visas to live in Great Britain, aren't specifically even in a crisis area, that they're fraudulent. And based on this video, it's very troubling the fact that ISIS has a new focus, it's specifically targeting Christians and going through how exactly they capture these Christians. They have an alliance with an Egyptian terror group and it's called Ansar Bayat al Makdis, if I'm saying that correctly. And the, the presumption is that they've used these people to capture Christians in Egypt and uh, behead them off the Mediterranean coast in Libya. But one thing is definitely clear that ISIS has a new agenda. It's to behead and decapitate as many Christians as they can, to bomb as many churches as they can, and they've laid forth a plan to do it here on U.S. soil. I'm Margaret Hal reporting for Infowars.com. So there's a really weird viral video making the rounds. It appears to show an occult ritual taking place outside of the CERN facility in Geneva. Now, the video was filmed at night. It depicts a mock ritual human sacrifice. Several individuals are in black cloaks, and then they surround a woman who then appears to be stabbed. Now, the European Organization for Nuclear Research has launched an investigation into the video, saying it's most likely a prank gone too far, right? Because these are scientists who apparently on their off time like to engage in uh, mock sacrifice just for funsies. So a CERN spokeswoman said that these scenes were filmed on our premises, but without official permission or knowledge, although indicating that those involved in the spoof did have access badges because CERN IDs are checked systematically at each entry to the CERN site, whether it's day or night. CERN does not condone this type of spoof, which can give rise to misunderstandings about the scientific nature of our work. And indeed, that's exactly what has happened. Apparently, these scientists were wanting to create some sort of a viral video, and it worked. But now there's all sorts of conspiracy theories percolating around the video, because this isn't the first time that CERN scientists have been involved in weird, bizarre, occultic videos. Uh, a film was made called Symmetry. It's a dance opera film shot inside CERN, and it depicts a modern physicist searching for the smallest primordial particle and instead discovers a love without end. So what they do at CERN, uh, physicists and engineers there are probing for the fundamental structure of the universe. They're using the world's largest and most complex scientific instruments to study the basic constituents of matter, which are the fundamental particles. So CERN houses arguably one of the greatest inventions mankind has ever seen, the Large Hadron Collider. Now, the Large Hadron Collider is the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator. Uh, what it does is it, it has two high-energy particle beams traveling at close to the speed of light before they are made to collide. And according to the LHC's main engineer, Steve Myers, this is like firing two needles across the Atlantic and getting them to hit each other. So one of the experiments that's taking place uh, is the quest for the Higgs boson, or the God particle. This is believed to be essential for formation of the universe. And the CERN scientists believe they've actually discovered and created this Higgs boson in 2012. Uh, they discovered a new subatomic particle that possibly is this uh, much sought after Higgs boson. Now, of course, we have a lot of knowledge that can come out of this kind of technology, but it's also bringing a lot of fears. 
Specifically, a few years ago, there was a lot of concern about uh, creating a black hole which could destroy life on Earth in its quest. And we know <laughs> mad scientists are perfectly okay with destroying Earth as long as they can play God. So of course it seems fitting that this latest occult spoof was staged in front of a statue of the Hindu deity Shiva, the destroyer. Now this statue is on permanent display at the complex. It was gifted to CERN from India. They were sort of celebrating uh, their decades long association with CERN, but it's a very interesting statue, very symbolic. Uh, there. This is uh, the form of the dancing Lord Shiva. It's known as the Nataraja, and a lot of people have called this the dance of destruction. Um, it symbolizes Shakti or life force, and it represents Lord Shiva dancing the universe into existence, influencing it, and then eventually destroying it in preparation for a new universe, which is exactly what a lot of people believe could happen at the CERN facility. So here is actually a really great explanation of the symbolism behind this statue from the History Channel's Ancient Aliens. Shiva's cosmic dance is not seen as a negative, even though it is greatly destructive. It is destroying in order for something new to be created. Things are cleared away so new things, new possibilities, better possibilities can emerge. Could Shiva not only be a mythological deity, that represents the ancient Hindu's understanding of the universe, but might he also have been an otherworldly being who passed on information to our ancestors that we are only now rediscovering. Always incredibly interesting theories there in ancient aliens. So while CERN scientists have already debunked this idea of the possibility of an Earth-destroying black hole, uh, the short answer is that cosmic rays from space are constantly pummeling Earth with energies that dwarf those of the Large Hadron Collider. But they do have some theories suggesting that formation of tiny quantum black holes might be possible. And they also acknowledge that they're probing for the presence of extra dimensions. So are we on the verge of discovering uh, our true origins or are we acting out a prophecy that once foretold a time when man would claim victory over ignorance while simultaneously destroying the, the old world, making way for the new world that would arise? So you get Rachel Maddow up there with her tiny audience of a couple hundred thousand people and her little ironic glasses. And, you know, she tries to look like Chris Hayes because it's bad for a woman to look like a woman. I mean, I just point this out, that, that, that that's how much these people hate life, okay? And she gets up there and lies to her audience about how Obamacare is free and, or Obamacare is wonderful or Obamacare, you can keep your doctor. And then she constantly, I, I'm told almost every day, I, don't, I, I rarely watch it, but I did this morning, a clip of it, said that I'm a liar. And then I said Hillary Clinton had a brain tumor and had autism and had syphilis and had Parkinson's disease. What I said was Ben Carson and a bunch of other neurologists and brain surgeons and psychologists and neurologists, a bunch of them we've had on the show. In fact, a bunch of big TV doctors just came out who were even nonpartisan. It was on Infowars.com yesterday. In fact, you guys, I meant to play that clip, reprint that article about some of those new doctors that came out and said, yeah, yeah Dr. Drew, you name it. And there's so many, I can't keep track of it and said, this lady has got something seriously wrong with her. She looks like hell. She's gotta be held up. She made a big joke about Pillowgate that, that, that she claims we made up too. No, it's not Pillowgate, it's Stoolgate because she has to sit on a stool and can't stand up for more than five minutes. Something's wrong with her. They admit she campaigns a couple days a week and then has to go rest. She, she told the press, she, if she laid down during the DNC, she would not have been able to get up. So they lie and say that we're the progenitors of this. If anybody's the progenitor, and by the way, he gets the credit, Matt Drudge, back in 2012, 2013, when she was just Secretary of State, nobody even cared, when she disappeared for a year into a hospital and would come out with her head all wrapped when you did see her, you know, on a cane. She clearly had brain surgeries and a bunch of other stuff. A year. He just started asking, hey, is, is Hillary sick? I'm like, You're crazy. You can't ask if someone's sick when they're in a hospital for a year. How preposterous. But that's what Rachel Maddow does. And all of them. Is they get up there and they lie to you and say that 
I said that she had a brain tumor. I, I jokingly said, yeah, as big as a watermelon, because they're, you know, we're lying about Trump saying he dropped out. But other than that, it was a joke. But I said, these doctors say neurologically something is seriously wrong with her. And a lot of them do think it's post-op from a brain tumor. I don't know. All I know is she's got a guy with a tranquilizer dart. And she's stumbling around everywhere and, 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 and she, it seriously has problems. But let's start going to this clip and I'll play the rest of the next segment. Here it is. This morning, as the entire political world was surprised and a little rattled to wake up to the news that the Trump campaign is getting a whole new top leadership team less than 90 days from the election, and it's going to be led by the head of Breitbart News, of all things. While that was the mainstream, oh my God, new political news story of the day, the front page of the conservative mothership website today, the Drudge Report, instead led today with this. Pillows for Hillary. Hmm? And when you, you click through, you get um, this expose on how Hillary Clinton um, is supposedly constantly being propped up on pillows. And there's these photos that have big yellow arrows pointing to the incriminating right, evidence. Let's that pause. Secretary if you scroll further, though, which they don't show you, we're to come back and show you, it's Secret Service holding her up and a guy with a pen and her falling down and her... Oh, oh then they say, we produced a video that shows her head doing weird things. No, she did that. I, I mean, this is just unbelievable to watch uh, th this guy sit here and pull these scams on his audience. I'm Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. Since equality is a major social justice issue right now, I want to debunk the idea that total equality is actually what humanity needs. What humanity really desires is actually self-determination, which is free will. I want to bring to you a short story written by Kurt Vonnegut in 1961. I'd like to thank my English teacher in eighth grade, Mrs. Barry, because she gave me the idea for this story. It's widely available online right now. But the story is a satirical, dystopic science fiction representation of what society would look like if total egalitarianism actually existed. This story was even cited by the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia in his dissent for the case of PGA Tour versus Martin. You can look it up. But he says animal farm determination that fairness and the ADA mean that everyone gets to play by individual rules, which will assure that no one's lack of ability will be a handicap. This story bears resemblance to other dystopic films and uh, books such as 1984, The Matrix, and this is a situation where self-determination has actually been eliminated, and now the state decides how and if people will live. I'm going to read the first few paragraphs of Kurt Vonnegut's work so you can get a sense of the type of society that he's profiling in this story. Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. The year was 2081 and everyone was finally equal. There weren't only equal before God and the law. They were equal in every which way. No one was smarter than anybody else. No one was better looking than anybody else. No one was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All of this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th Amendments to the Constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. It was tragic, all right, but George and Hazel couldn't think about it very hard. Hazel had perfectly average intelligence, which meant she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal, had a mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. Harrison Bergeron was also made into a film in 1995. Let's take a look at a clip from the film so that we can see what that was all about. Earth Bergeron, B minus. I think you had a B plus on the last geography test, didn't you? Yes, Miss Hopkins. Well, this is quite an improvement. Thank you. Morris Wilkerson, C minus. Good work, Morris. Geraldine Hoberman, C. Congratulations, Geraldine. <laughs> Harrison Bergeron, A+. Plus.
So the film and the novel, or, or the short story, actually differ in some ways. But that's how, essentially, Harrison Bergeron starts out. Because this guy is a seven-foot-tall athlete, uh, and he has genius intelligence, 14-year-old Harrison is taken away from his parents, George and Hazel, so that he can be indoctrinated by the state, and handicapped as well. Uh, remember that children are being taken away from their parents in this story, because I'm also going to talk about how that's happening right now in China. China is the leading totalitarian state in the world. People are routinely tortured in China. Citizens in this story are also constantly tortured by the government through various means, including being weighed down by sandbags, wearing glasses that blur vision, and wearing headsets that blast out sharp noises, all due to state-mandated requirements to equalize people. They are dumbed down, just like Charlotte Iserby described in The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, through the educational system and through television, the true opiate of the masses. Beautiful people must be disfigured or forced to wear hideous masks. Each person is forced to subjugate their special attributes to the will of the state. We know that the destruction of pure beauty and goodness is a hallmark of authoritarian regimes. And this story aptly depicts a situation where you have an entire society of mass Stockholm syndrome victims, worse than currently North Korea is. The government destroys the free market because, like J.D. Rockefeller said, competition is a sin. It's a socialist communist system run by bloodthirsty sociopaths. Aristotle once said that art imitates life, but in this case, the headlines indicate that life imitates art. This reminds me of China. I wonder how such an undemocratic, socialist, communist, whatever you want to call it, country who does not value individuality could be doing so well at the Olympics. This is an article from May 2016 that describes how they actually do it, how they actually achieve this. Headline, has China gone far enough to get rid of child cruelty in Olympics training? In the past, the tears in this child's eyes could have been symbolic of a state system that has pushed its children too far in pursuit of Olympic glory. Since the 1980s, China has been dogged by allegations of child cruelty in its sporting system, with stories of supposed beatings and grueling training regimes not uncommon. Going back to Vonnegut's story, everyone must be, quote, equal in all ways. Anyone who's perceived to be above average is diminished so that they don't make others feel bad for having special attributes. In China, it's actually the opposite. When children are found to have special attributes or special talent, you're actually taken away from your parents and sent to a state-sponsored special school. They're sent there and they're tortured, basically, and pushed to the limits to achieve Olympic glory. The point is actually to raise children for a specific state-mandated purpose, rather than the purpose of having a meaningful life where you take care of your family and just enjoy life. The question is, do we all work for central bankers? They claim to be reforming their style. So let's watch a video from this year explaining what these children in these Chinese state-sponsored sports schools actually have to go through. So it's sad that these children are actually afraid to even mention that they actually want to be outside playing rather than doing this endless training. And this is part of the totalitarian regime where they want these children to maintain a singular focus. So what's causing them to have this singular focus? Well, I think it's similar to The Matrix, Brave New World in 1984, where there's this similar theme of television numbing people's minds. In Vonnegut's story, it's a virtue signaling tool controlled by the thought police to cause people to self-censor like these children did. When you read the story Harrison Bergeron, you'll learn that the protagonist represents the individual's defiance against the state. One man. Anytime I listen to great music or watch a great film, I realize that our society will never produce any more of them. Is going to change the world. There's a young rebel 
who has taken over the television master control room. I'm starting the third American revolution. I'm going to have a little chat with the whole country. He's going to show them the one thing they've been missing. You haven't made everybody equal. You've made them the same, and there's a big difference. He's showing them how to have fun. Harrison represents the alpha male archetype who questions authority and who has an urge to succeed. He's like a Matt Drudge or an Alex Jones who disseminates information and also aggregates information so that the citizenry is informed. I'm not going to wait around and watch my family die around me. The moral of the story is that progressivism is like a cancer. It's malignant. And when state-sponsored programs promote egalitarianism, unethical and tyrannical results could be the outcome. We shouldn't want totalitarian equality. What we need is equality of opportunity, self-determination, and individual sovereignty. We can't alter the Constitution beyond recognition, as it was in this story, without losing credibility as well as liberty. Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut is effectively Hillary's America. She wants total control. I'm definitely not with her. This is Ashley Beckford for Infowars.com. Stay tuned for more special reports. All right, folks, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. Infowars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Until then, have a blessed evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Say goodbye, Hillary. Goldman Sachs didn't expect anything in return. They just liked my speeches.